Welcome to Let's Talk Thyroid, where we explore different aspects of living a healthy thyroid lifestyle, positively and practically, to help you thrive and not just survive. Join me, Annabelle Bateman, your host, and let's talk thyroid. This podcast has been proudly supported by, well, me. I am fully backing my podcast and getting the Let's Talk Thyroid message out to you. If you are interested in purchasing essential oils, that is one of the ways that uh, you can support me and I can support you and essential oils can support your overall thyroid health and wellness. So if that's something that you would like to add to your health and wellness toolkit uh, of resources that you can access to support you in a number of different ways, send me a message. I'd love to help you find what suits your individual needs and budget. Or you can head to AnnabelleBateman.com and follow the links there to essential oils. Think digestive support, stress management, reducing your toxic load, all sorts of ways that we can use essential oils as part of our overall lifestyle approach to managing health and wellness. What do these things have in common? Reflux, bloating, diarrhea, some respiratory symptoms like a cough, sinusitis, asthma, skin reactions like eczema, um, psoriasis, that sort of irritated skin, what do all those things have in common? Well, sad to say they can be symptoms of a dairy intolerance. And how does that connect to thyroid? Well, wait, uh, because I'm going to cover all of that in today's episode. We're going to talk about what is a dairy intolerance, is that different to being lactose intolerant, why on earth is dairy a problem for the thyroid in the first place? Uh, and we're going to cover things like um, what sort of dairy are we talking about? Cow's milk, sheep, goat, uh, all of it. Is ghee okay? So we're going to cover all of those sort of questions. Plus, how do you know if you have an issue with dairy? How would you eliminate it if that was what you were going to do? And what are some of the alternatives? And we'll get into some really practical things. And I'm going to share some recipes and ideas with you as well. So the idea of going dairy-free to me is much tougher than going gluten-free. This is something that I have battled with far more. In fact, I found it much easier to give up the gluten than to give up dairy and look, really for me, what I have done, um, and I'll talk about this as we get, get into it, is I have had periods where I've been totally dairy free and I've been able to reintroduce some dairy, uh, like butter mostly. Um, and over time I've, I've played with, um, you know, with milk and cream and ice cream and all those sorts of things. So, um, but we'll cover off on all of that. I'm just I'm certainly not saying that I'm 100% dairy-free all the time, um, but look, to be honest, when I am, I do feel better. So we'll cover all of those things. So let's dive right in and talk about what actually is a dairy intolerance. And this is not from a medical point of view. This is just my understanding of the reading and research. Uh, like with all of these things, if you want to dig right into the science, then please do that. Um, what I'm trying to do is bridge some of that gap, do some of the reading and research, explain it in my simple <laughs> dumbed down terms so that we can all understand it. Um, but if something here either you're not sure about or you want to dig into it further, um, I am going to put a few links to some studies at the, uh, in the show notes uh, for this episode, um, but do your own reading and research and see what you find. So dairy intolerance intolerance is not the same as a dairy allergy. We're not talking about an anaphylaxis type of response here. And my understanding of intolerances, similar to gluten intolerance, is that they can be acquired over time and um, it, it's not like you, you may not drink a glass of milk and immediately feel something different. But accumulatively over time, your body can struggle to digest, um, in this case dairy, and so you can build up some um, some of those symptoms like we were talking about before, they might creep up gradually, they might be, might be chronic, um, but sometimes an intolerance is sitting behind these. So just know we're not talking about allergy here. And also a dairy intolerance um, is not the same as a lactose intolerance. 
which I find quite interesting because often we talk, I guess, that lactose-free and lactose-free milk and cream and all of those things have become um, more readily available, but it's not the same actually as uh, a dairy intolerance because a dairy intolerance um, generally comes from being intolerant to the casein, which is the protein, one of the main proteins in dairy. That's what's the common trigger for thyroid. Um, and in fact, when I, I did a course um, on now, it's probably a month or two ago, a couple of months ago, through the Karatsian Institute, all about Hashimoto's, and Dr. Karatsian talked a lot about the, the many different common triggers for autoimmune thyroid, specifically Hashimoto's, but the, often some similarities uh, in Graves as well, because it's the autoimmune triggers. So I might, I'll put that image in the show notes as well, because there's lots of different triggers, not just dietary triggers, but casein is definitely one of them. Now, what I uh, learned is that about 80% of dairy proteins are casein and about 20% are whey. And of those 80% of the casein, there are two main types. You've got A1 and A2. And it's thought that the A1 casein is tends to be the one that's more problematic. Um, so if you're going to look at removing dairy and you're wanting to try reintroducing it, you could even look at um, reintroducing with A2 milk first and see how you go with that. Um, but do some digging in. Like, feel free to go and do a bit more research about that A1 versus A2. Um, I do buy A2 milk from my family. Um, I don't drink it because uh, I have kind of replaced milk um, with non-dairy milk, but um, the rest of my family um, use A2 milk. And to me, I guess it's a, uh, that it's a bit like I buy them gluten-free um, pasta. It's just a, a way of reducing, I guess, some of the, that exposure. It's not, not eliminating it. Now, the difference with lactose um, and why some people are lactose intolerant is that the lactose is actually the sugar component in the dairy, not the protein. So apparently, um, from what I read, lactose intolerance won't, call intestinal, won't cause intestinal inflammation. Um, but there has been a study done on lactose and Hashimoto's, and I'll put the link to this in the show notes. But of the, I think there was about 83 people um, with Hashimoto's, they tested them and 75% had a lactose intolerance. And then they went on to remove lactose from some of the, uh, the people in the study's diets and they found that that actually reduced the TSH levels for those people. So if you want to dive into that study, I will put the link in the show notes. Um, there's obviously more detail than that. Um, but it's interesting, isn't it? For some, it could be lactose that's the issue, some the casein. But let's explore the question really of why is dairy a problem for the thyroid at all? So one is it seems to be a common trigger for that autoimmunity. Second, only to gluten. And we've certainly talked a lot about removing gluten from our diet. And we've touched on some things that are um, called gluten cross reactivity. And we've touched on grains. Uh, but this we're just going to dive right into the dairy. So pretty common uh, for those of us with thyroid issues, if we're going to see a holistic doctor or someone who's really up with all of the thy treating thyroid patients to recommend a gluten and dairy free diet. Um, and that, and so it can be, you know, that it can be a trigger. It's also commonly an inflammatory food. And so from my perspective, when the way I manage my health from a big picture perspective, it's all about reducing inflammation in, in every part of my body. And so all the different things I do is about trying to reduce inflammation. So from a dietary perspective, it's about removing the things that are commonly inflammatory. Uh, from a lifestyle perspective, it's about trying to reduce stress because I know that stress promotes uh, inflammation. Uh, even things like not doing high intensity exercise because that places a stress on my body. So, and that can create inflammation. <laughs> so, uh, for me, the idea of because dairy is a commonly inflammatory food, that's a good reason to explore removing that from my diet. And it's certainly something I've done, as I said at the beginning, 
from time to time in different, you know, in different ways um, over time. And it is something I've struggled struggled with. The, glu- the gluten-free really, I, really is not a non-issue for me now. The dairy um, comes and goes. <laughs> um, I've all, in the research, also people said, um, I found, you know, that you could want to look at avoiding dairy because of hormones in the milk or because of the pasteurization and homogenization processes. Um, I don't know a whole lot about that. I didn't find a lot of information about that, uh, but that's certainly something you could explore if you wanted to. Another reason to avoid dairy or to why why dairy can be a problem for the thyroid is that it can be a, glut, a gluten, uh, it can be a gluten cross reaction. <laughs> um, so that is because the dairy proteins closely resemble the gluten proteins, which closely resemble the thyroid structure and so can cause a similar immune response in the body. So I'm going to actually read you some, a section at the, all about this concept of cross-reactivity uh, from Dr. Isabella Wentz because she puts it in a way that Um, I just can't put it Uh, It's that depth of scientific knowledge. But, um, and the cross cross reactivity, I think warrants a whole other episode that I'll I'll do at some point down the track. And I'll, I think I'll get in an expert to talk about that, um, who understands it at the depth that, um, that I don't. So this is what Dr. Isabella Wentz says. Uh, She says, so if you have gut permeability, uh, so that's like, you know, leaky gut, you know, you, you know, really all of us with autoimmune issues have gut permeability. Um, so your gut is likely to recognize casein and whey as a foreign invader and make antibodies to those proteins uh, because it wants to protect itself from what it perceives to be a threat. So sometimes it's the IgG branch. Now, I'm not going to go into IgG and IgA. Uh, that's like uh, the different kinds of intolerances. Um, and allergies. So so sometimes it's the IgG branch of the immune system that reacts. A reaction of this kind is known as a type 4 delayed hypersensitivity reaction. And so this is Annabelle talking now. I think that's the intolerance versus the allergy. So it says, guess what other kinds of antibodies are IgG mediated? Thyroid antibodies, and more specifically, the TPO and the TG antibodies. In fact, Hashimoto's is also considered a type 4 delayed hypersensitivity. As far as I'm aware, and this is Isabella Wentz talking, uh, the research doesn't exist on this yet. However, experience shows that eating foods that stimulate the release of IgG antibodies and promote a type 4 delayed hypersensitivity response will also increase thyroid antibodies. Perhaps it's turning on the faucet effect, or perhaps dairy proteins cross-react with the thyroid gland. More research is needed to quantify this exact reaction, but I can say that people who are dairy sensitive and have Hashimoto's will have a reduction in thyroid symptoms and antibodies when they remove dairy from their diets. And I will put a link um, to the article from the thyroid pharmacist um, about that dairy free, um, about that that comment. But isn't it interesting? Um, And even just anecdotally, this is we often notice that when we remove those inflammatory foods like gluten and dairy, it actually does impact on our autoimmune response and our thyroid antibodies often will um, reduce. So in fact, um, just recently, my mum has been diagnosed with Hashimoto's. Uh, I always thought I was a genetic anomaly in the family, but apparently not. And she has been amazing actually in the last probably, I don't know, six weeks or so has cut cut out gluten grains dairy and has seen a reduction in both her tsh and her thyroid antibody levels and um so it's amazing she's starting to feel better um and i just think it just reminds me just how powerful um food can be uh, and what an impact that that can make so there we go uh, the other thing to know, so we, we're still we're chatting here about why is dairy a problem. Uh, so it can actually interfere with thyroid function. So there's a, a study about that too that I'll put in, in the link. Um, but eating dairy can actually interfere with thyroid function. So if you have a dairy intolerance and keep eating it, 
you might actually need more medication to function. So, um, so I guess removing the dairy can have an impact on that need uh, or dosage for medication. And as I said, I'll pop that the study link to that in the show notes. Now, uh, in the Facebook group, um, the Let's Talk Thyroid community, I did ask if anyone had any questions about uh, dairy and thyroid. And Dana asked, she, she said, I've heard that it's best not to take thyroid medication within 30 minutes of eating dairy. And um, that's definitely something that, that um, I've heard. It probably get, will depend on your medication. Certainly the standard thyroxin uh, or T4 replacement medication, it's not recommended to eat or drink anything actually other than water from minimum 30 if not 60 minutes from the time you take your medication. So if that's anything, um, and I have heard that with the dairy. In fact, I've heard some people say up to two hours after taking the medication, um, don't consume dairy. I actually had a look in the t in the fine print in my thyroid medication pill box, and it actually it, it doesn't say anything specifically about dairy. But if the general advice is don't have you know, anything to eat within 30 to 60 minutes, say, of taking a thyroid medication, probably a good idea to avoid dairy. Um, the other thing that's actually quite interesting is that some thyroid medication, including the one I take, contains um, lactose. So, uh, for, and so for some people that can be a massive, a massive issue if you're very, very sensitive. Uh, so, that's a whole other topic, but the, some fillers in the thyroid medication can actually be triggers for some people. So um, if you, that could be something that's worth exploring too, if you know you're very sensitive. So there's a number of different reasons as to why dairy and thyroid are, are not a match made in heaven. Um, but are we talking all dairy? Like what, what does, how do you define dairy? Are we talking cow's milk, sheep's milk, goat milk, oat milk? <laughs> you know, um, what, what are we talking? So from what I can gather, the sheep and goat's milk proteins are very similar to cow's milk. So if you're avoiding dairy, it's best to avoid sheep, goat and cow milk. Um, I actually posted in um, the Facebook group recently about camel milk, which um, was a shared post actually from Isabella Wentz. And so camel milk apparently has no whey and different casein structure. So that could be worth exploring. Um, I'm not sure how readily available camel milk is in your area. Um, I did have somebody who reply to that um, post and say that at $20 a bottle, it wasn't a, um, you know, <laughs> a financially viable alternative on a regular basis. So um, I don't know, do some looking into that. I've never tried camel milk, but apparently that might be okay as a replacement. Um, what about ghee and butter? You know, so sometimes people will say, well, I'm dairy free, but I still eat butter. Um, so butter is low in casein, but not actually casein free. So Again, it will probably depend on your level of intolerance or sensitivity um, as to whether butter is okay. But technically, butter is dairy, right? So, and same with ghee. So ghee is still dairy and still contains casein. So, um, you know, maybe some people might tolerate that after a period of elimination um, and some won't. So apparently you can source casein free ghee, but that's not something I've looked into. But if you know about that, if you've discovered uh, casein ghee, um, then yeah, share it with me, let me know, and we can share it with the community um, because looking at alternatives, which we're about to do in a minute, is, is, um, is really helpful. So how do you actually know if you have an issue with dairy? Well, let's remind ourselves of what the common symptoms are. Uh, so it was reflux, bloating, diarrhea, um, some respiratory symptoms, things like cough, sinusitis, asthma can be symptoms, skin reactions. So, and remembering often that skin is a reflection of gut. So like your eczema, psoriasis, those sort of skin irritations can be a symptom. So how do you know if you have an issue with dairy? Well, I would say if you have any of those symptoms, then it's worth exploring um, whether eliminating dairy has an impact on those symptoms. 
But statistically, based on that study I mentioned before, if you've got Hashimoto's, then stats would say that 75% are likely to at least have a lactose intolerance, if not a full dairy intolerance. Um, and if it's the second most common trig dietary trigger to autoimmune um, thyroid issues, second to gluten, then it is a pretty good chance <laughs> that if you've got Hashimoto's and possibly Graves um, from that autoimmune response, you could well have an issue with dairy. And it pains me to say that because I do love dairy. Um, and so I think for a long time I've lived with my head in the sand that it's an issue. And so I've kind of gradually re removed a lot of dairy from my diet. Um, but the best way to tell if you have an issue with dairy is to go off it um, and then reintroduce it and see how you feel. So at least a couple of weeks, um, totally no dairy at all. Um, so no milk, cheese, yogurt, butter, ghee, um, nothing. Uh, and no, not replacing it with this sheep's milk, sheep or goat's milk. Um, and just see how you feel. I mean, in the end, this is where something I say a lot is that we are our own health experiment. Um, you know, what works for me might not work for you. What works for you might not work for me. We all have to work out our own little um, individualized plan. Um, these are just some of the, the things I talk about are the things that are, are common, common for other people. Um, so if you're wanting to give up dairy, then, um, you know, give it a go. See how you feel. See if you notice any difference um, in, in any of your symptoms. I'm just going to throw in here that aside from elimination, a couple of other options to see if you have dairy sense, you know, intolerances or other intolerances would be to have a, an intolerance test. So this is something you could talk about with your doctor or your naturopath or health practitioner would be having one of those IgG, IgA tests uh, to, to see uh, if you're reacting to particular foods uh, or other substances. The other way that I've found helpful is through kinesiology which is muscle testing. And I talk about that in the episode uh, with Sharon Wilford, who is one of my, the naturopaths that I see. And so that has could be another way if you're open to that form of uh, assessment. But that, that you know, so there, you can get tested for food intolerances, but it is also common that eliminating um, that whole elimination diet is uh, a good way of seeing if you're intolerant as well. Giving up dairy doesn't have to be forever. Like, Annabelle, you are ruining my life. <laughs> I hope I'm not ruining your life. My goal is to actually make your life better. Um, but does it have to be forever? I don't know. Maybe. Or maybe not. Um, that is your trial and error. That's uh, what you've got to work out. I have worked out that generally I am do seem to be okay with butter. Um, but I have removed milk. Ice cream seems, seems to um, give me reflux. And I, I guess that could be the combination of the dairy and the sugar and the fats. Um, high fat cheeses often are not a good, um, don't seem to work well for me. But I don't have a gallbladder either. So, you know, sometimes it is hard to tell these things. We're all unique and we've all got to try to figure it out for ourselves. Um, the other thing just to be aware of if you're going to eliminate dairy for a little while is just like gluten, dairy can actually be addictive in that when we break down dairy in our bodies, it can actually release what's called casomorphins, which is gives you that morphine effect, that kind of hit. So we can actually get withdrawal symptoms when we remove dairy and gluten out of our diets. But good news is those symptoms, those detox sort of, Symptoms don't last for too long, um, so um, stick with it, uh, but just be aware that you can get some of those withdrawal symptoms uh, when you give up um, dairy and gluten or dairy or gluten. Maybe it's better to just go whole hog and um, cut them both out at the same time. Um, I'm certainly going to guide people through that in October in a... Um, you know, kickstart your thyroid wellness program, um, like my 30-day uh, challenge. So stay tuned for that if you want to do, um, you know, 
try removing some of these things as part of a group and see how you feel. So what are some alternatives? What, you know, if we're going to cut out dairy, what, what can we use instead? Uh, so let's go through them kind of commonly topic by, you know, ingredient by ingredient. So from a milk point of view, um, so if you like to have milk in your coffee or on some, you know, muesli, um, or, you, or if you cook with milk, uh, coconut milk is a really good alternative, as are many of your nut milks, um, if you can tolerate nuts. So um, the, it is generally best to avoid soy milk. Um, soy is not great for thyroid health. Um, and um, yeah, so for me in my coffee, I do like to ha have a coffee each day. I use almond milk um, and I I tend to, I buy Milk Lab. It's a brand in Australia, Milk Lab Almond Milk. It's designed for baristas, so it foams up nicely. It's not the cleanest and purest almond milk. It's not like making your own almond milk, but from a, you know, when I weigh it all up, I'm happy to have a, a glass of that um, each day with my coffee. Um, I do have a recipe for how to make your own almond milk in my cookbook, um, What Annabelle Cooks. Uh, cookbook is all actually gluten, grain and dairy free. So if you're looking for dairy free inspiration and ideas, then you might want to consider getting your hands on my cookbook. I think I've only got about 65 maybe 70 copies left. So uh, you might want to snapple one of those up. It's only $30. Um, if you're outside of Australia, the ebook is available for $14.95 too, um, both from my website, Um So cheese, when it comes to cheese, um, it cheese is harder. Let's just be real. Um, cashew cheese is great. And there are some great brands that I've found locally um, in the health food shop. Uh, you can make your own if you've got like a Thermomix or a Vitamix or a high speed blender. I've never actually done it, to be honest. I'm quite happy just to spend the money to buy that. It, um, and that it's, I suppose, it's a bit more like a, a spread. It's a spreadable cheese. <coughs> it goes quite nicely watered down as a salad dressing or as a dip. Uh, but cashew cheese is a really great option. Uh, I've got a recipe for a Parmesan cheese um, alternative. It's like a sprinkle that uses um, nutritional yeast. Um, I'll pop the recipe for that in the show notes. But that's nice sprinkled on, I don't know, meats or salads or vegetables um, and just gives that cheesy sort of taste. Uh, you will find dairy-free cheese um, in the supermarket and health food shops. So just have a look at those. You want to make sure, I guess, when we're buying processed food that there's not too many other nasties. So health food shops are often a good place to look for those things. Uh, in fact, actually, when mum and dad were staying recently, we found a, um, a dairy-free grated cheese because we were making nachos for Alex's birthday and um, wanted to. mum wanted to have a bit of cheese on that so and she said look it was it was okay it was fine <laughs> so that there's options for you um ice cream look there's definitely if you look even in the supermarket these days there's nut milk ice creams there's coconut ice creams that are all quite palatable uh, or of course you can make your own uh yogurt um again like i've started to see some nut milk yogurts um i like coconut yogurt i don't like the there are a few different brands of coconut yogurts as well. Um, so butter. Uh, so alternatives to butter would be things like like even avocado, like an avocado, uh, fresh avocado spread on some toast. Um, that can be really great. And avocado is such great healthy fat. Um, coconut oil can be used in most recipes to replace butter, uh, even you know, in your cakes and slices and that sort of thing. Uh, nut butters or seed butters can also be used as, as a spread. Just don't use margarine. Um, there's lots of chemicals in margarine. Um, so um, other places that you find dairy might be things like protein shakes, like if you use whey protein, whey-based protein shakes. Um, there are vegan protein shakes that you can get. Um, I use the doTERRA trim shake if I'm making a smoothie um, and it's Mm, I think it's pea, I think it might be pea and quinoa based. Um, so they are legumes, so it just depends how your gut goes with those. But I find every now and again, if I want a smoothie, um, 
um, with some protein powder I'll use that and it seems okay um, but you can yeah look at vegan shakes if you're looking for a dairy free um, protein shake so there you have it um, lots and lots of um, recipes online if you are wanting to go looking for dairy free um, what I often do if I'm looking you know if I'm googling for a recipe um, so like I was talking to mum just before um, whilst sort of in the middle of recording this and it's dad's birthday tomorrow and mum as I said is going is you know, basically following a paleo-ish diet at the moment um, and so, and dad really likes carrot cakes. So she Googled paleo carrot cake. If you Google the paleo carrot cake or paleo, I don't know, brownies or whatever, um, you'll find options there that are gluten, grain and dairy free. And so, you know, then adapt it from there. But I often find if I Google, say like a dairy free recipe, it might have be made with regular flour. If I Google a gluten-free recipe, it just might be made with gluten-free flour. Um, so I find a good basic place to start when I'm looking online is to is just to search for paleo recipes. Uh, I do have a number of dairy-free recipes on whatannabellecooks.com too for free. Um, lots of recipes on there. There is a category called dairy-free, so have a look in there. Certainly the cookbook has lots. Uh, and I'm more than happy if um, when this goes live, if you want, if you're in the Let's Talk Thyroid community, which I hope you are, and if you're not, please join. Love to have you there. Uh, then share away, share your favourite dairy-free recipes or dairy-free products, because this is how we discover what's out there, what what you love, what's you know some hidden gem. That's one of the things I love about. Uh, the community, you know, that having that community around these topics is that we can learn and share from each other. So there you have it. Let me know if you wanting to any help um, in eliminating dairy, or if you've got a story about how going dairy free has impacted your health. Again, share it in the community or send me a message. I'd love to know um, and have that information to share with others too. Did you know that one of the things that I offer? is a free 30 minute strategy session. So if you want the opportunity to sit down with me, talk about your health goals and make a plan, um, create some action steps, or just talk things through with someone who gets it, uh, then more than happy for you to book in for a strategy session. I'll, again, I'll put the link to that in the show notes. Uh, send me a message and I'd love to connect with you. Have an awesome week, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Let's Talk Thyroid. I would love it if you would subscribe to the podcast and share it with others that you know with thyroid problems. Let's get the message out there. If you'd like to connect with me further, the best place to do that is via my website, AnnabelleBateman.com. From there, you'll be able to join my Facebook group, book a strategy session with me, download my freebie um, and access any show notes for this episode. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time. Bye. The information presented and discussed in this podcast is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure or prevent any disease and should not be used as a substitute for proper advice from a qualified professional.